So let's um, then, uh, without further ado, just launch directly into this topic. So why is this topic so important? Why even bother to discuss this topic this evening? Um, well, there's a number of reasons. One is that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is fundamentally Trinitarian from beginning to end. The gospel was initiated by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and then applied by the Holy Spirit. Um, and so the gospel cannot be divorced from the doctrine of the Trinity. It's inextricably interwoven with the Trinity. And so the Trinity, I would contend, is a most important doctrine for us to defend as Christians. It is not a, an optional uh, add-on to our faith. It's not an accessory. It's an absolutely fundamental issue. Uh, second reason why it's important is that biblical Unitarians and other groups maintain that the Old Testament is at least functionally, if not dogmatically, Unitarian. On this basis, they often attempt to shoehorn the New Testament into a Unitarian mold because they are convinced that the Old Testament always presented only one divine person uh, throughout biblical history. And so they try to interpret the New Testament in view of that paradigm. Um, and I think this is actually quite a cogent uh, argument that, um, that Unitarians make, is that um, if God only reveals himself as triune when we get to the New Testament, then... Uh, th then uh, What's, what's to prevent us from saying that there could be a, a potential fourth divine person hiding in the shadows waiting to be revealed at a future point. So my contention is that God has always revealed himself as triune, that the Trinity is not a New Testament doctrine, but a biblical doctrine right from start to finish. Moreover, the remarkable continuity between the Old and New Testaments provides powerful evidence for the divine inspiration of Scripture. I think that uh, Unitarians, unfortunately, miss out on some of the beauty of Scripture and some of the depths and riches of Scripture because of their denial of the uh, triune uh, character of the biblical Scriptures. So then I'm going to be presenting to you five main arguments this evening. The first is that the Hebrew Scriptures teach a plurality of divine persons. So I'll give examples. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is one of those divine persons. Thirdly, the Messiah is a divine person. Fourthly, the angel of the Lord is a divine person. And fifthly, the Messiah is the angel of the Lord. Um, for those of you who don't know, the doctrine of the Trinity basically asserts that there's one divine essence or being. Um, and within that being or essence, there are three co-equal, co-eternal divine persons, namely the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I'm going to be arguing that you can find uh, not only the personal uh, plurality of God in the Old Testament, but also that there are three divine persons, the, fa the Father, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. So one text that often comes up in these discussions when we're dealing with the Old Testament is the Jewish Shema, found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, o Israel, the Lord, um, our God, the Lord is one. Um, and this often is brought up and uh, brought to our attention by biblical Unitarians who maintain that the Old Testament always has advocated for a Unitarian model. That is to say that God is one and only one person. Um, however, the Hebrew word that is used in Deuteronomy 6 for, for one is ekad. Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Ekad. Ekad is the word that's used for one. And ekad can, but does not always, but can refer to a composite or compound unity. And so I would argue that it doesn't uh, commit us to a Unitarian view of God. For example, in Genesis 2.24, Adam and Eve become one flesh. Again, the Hebrew word used there is ekad. In Genesis 3.22, Adam and Eve become one with God. Again, the Hebrew word used there is ikad. In Genesis 11.6, the people were one. Again, the word used there is ikad. And there's many other examples I could give, but suffice it to show that, uh, that, the, that the Hebrew word ikad can, but does not always refer to a composite or compound unity. So then what about, pers what about divine plurality in the Old Testament? Well, let's take an example from the book of Zechariah. This is one of my favorite examples. In the book of Zechariah in chapter, num chapter number two, the context here is um, the people of Israel are in exile in Babylon, and God is promising their restoration and their return to their land. He says, up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread... Um, you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the, um, to the nations who plundered you. Now, wait a minute, I'm confused. Yahweh has sent Yahweh. But then we continue. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they should become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Wait a minute, Yahweh has sent Yahweh? There it is again. 
Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Three times there, not once, not twice, not two times, but three times, we read that Yahweh has been sent by Yahweh. That, I would contend, is only compatible with um, a view of God that allows for his personal plurality. Um, but we, uh, we press on. Take another example from the book of Proverbs and Proverbs 30. There's many other, these examples could be multiplied quite, for quite a while. I'm just giving you um, a few highlights here. Proverbs 30, first four verses. The sayings of Agur, son of Jackie, and an inspired utterance. This man's utterance to Itiel. I'm weary, God, but I can prevail. Surely I am only a brute, not a man. I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. And so uh, this individual, Agur, is contemplating the unfathomability, the incomprehensibility of God, that God cannot be understood by human comprehension. Uh, and he goes on to ask a series of rhetorical questions. He says, who has gone up to heaven and come down? The answer is obviously God. Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Again, the answer is obviously God. Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Again, obviously God. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God. And then it says, what is his name? Now, to know someone's name is a Jewish idiom for to understand their nature. Um, and so it's, um, he's saying, what is his name? And what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Now, the answer to this rhetorical question in context is, well, no, we don't know the, the name because we don't understand God's nature. That's the point of, the, of these four verses. Um, and so we, since God's nature is incomprehensible, it can be said in that sense that we do not know the name. Um, and so in the same sense that God is incomprehensible, here it indicates that the Son is incomprehensible. The Son here should be taken then as a divine being in the same sense that Yahweh is a divine being. So there's another text, I think, that indicates divine plurality. And as I said, there are many other examples that we could look at, but time is fleeting, so we press on. Let's look at my next argument then. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament um, is, one of, is, is one of the divine persons. Um, well, we see, first of all, that the Holy Spirit is a personal agent, unlike what Jehovah's Witnesses might contend, that the Holy Spirit is some impersonal act of force. No, the Old Testament tells us that the Holy Spirit is a personal agency. He can be grieved. In Isaiah 63, verse 10, that speaks about the Israelites in the wilderness, that they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Now, if you look at uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, 40, we read about uh, the same context, the same situation, the Israelites rebelling against God in the wilderness. And it says how often they rebelled against him in context, that's speaking about the Lord God in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. So just as they grieved the Holy Spirit, according to Isaiah 63, Psalm 78, verse 40 says it was Yahweh that was grieved, thus putting the Holy Spirit, uh, representing the Holy Spirit as Yahweh. Um, we also see that the Holy Spirit has a personal distinctiveness. Uh, he, is, he is sent by Yahweh. For example, in Isaiah 48, verse 16, it says, Draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And by the way, that's Yahweh speaking. And uh, this also is uh, rings of Trinitarian type language. It says, And now the Lord God has sent me. So Yahweh, again, has been sent by Yahweh and his spirit. So the spirit has been sent by Yahweh. Is a, uh, the spirit, therefore, is indicated to be personally distinct. Um, Psalm 104, verse 30, again, when you send forth your spirit, they are created. And so the spirit is sent, and therefore he's personally distinct. Um, the Holy Spirit is also, is also represented as God in various uh by bestowing upon him various attributes, such as the ability to create, which is a prerogative ascribed only to God. Job 33, 4, for example, says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Um, Psalm 104, verse 30, When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So the Holy Spirit is a creator. He's omniscient. Uh, he's all-knowing. Isaiah 40, verse 13, Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? He has tremendous power. Um, we, we learn that uh, he rushes upon uh, Samson uh, and gives him tr uh, tremendous might. When you look at Isaiah 11, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of counsel and might. Um, in Zechariah 4, 6, and uh, he said to me, this is the word of the Lord, is Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the Holy Spirit is tremendously powerful. He's also omnipresent. Uh, Psalm 139, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? So these are attributes which would normally be ascribed to Yahweh. So the Holy Spirit, then I contend, is himself a divine person. But then are there any other divine persons that we should be aware of when we read through the Old Testament texts? Um, well, we have um, 
the Messiah, um, and I'm going to argue that the Messiah himself is a divine person. I, I think that Carlos and I should both agree that the Son of Man figure in Daniel is the Messiah because Jesus uses the title Son of Man as his favorite self-designation in the Gospels, so even identifying himself as the Danielic Son of Man before Caiaphas. Um, and in that, back in the book of Daniel, we read um, Daniel's vision. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, but the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here the Son of Man actually approaches the Ancient of Days. So we have a we have a distinction between persons. We have the Ancient of Days and we have the Son of Man. The Ancient of Days is undeniably God. But what about the Son of Man? Well, let me present to you three arguments for the Son of Man being a divine figure. Um, the, uh, first of all, we have the, the worship that's ascribed to the Son of Man. And uh, the Greek Septuagint translation of Daniel 7.14 uses the Greek word latru when describing the service that's to be rendered to the Son of Man. A latru in Greek denotes the very highest form of worship and religious service, a kind that is to be ascribed only to Yahweh. The Aramaic term that's used in the original Danielic text is Pelach. Now, in a religious context, um, serving a divine being translates into worship. And in fact, every time it's used throughout the book of Daniel, it's always used in a religious context, dealing with service or worship to a deity. Um, second argument then, in Daniel 6, verse 25 and 26, King Darius, after Daniel has been delivered from the lion's den, speaks about the God of Daniel. He says, and I quote, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will ne not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. The very same language that's used in the very next chapter of the Son of Man in Daniel's vision. Therefore, another reason to think that the Son of Man, in fact, is deity himself. Third argument is that the Son of Man is portrayed as riding the clouds. In Isaiah 19, um, in, in, the, in the Canaanite mythology, the Most High God, El, was called the Father of Years, and his son, Baal, was the one who rides the clouds. In the, in the Old Testament, the biblical writers took those images and applied them to the God of Israel. In Isaiah 19, 1, for example, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, etc. Deuteronomy 33, 26, There is none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. And we could give other examples as well. Psalm 104, 3, for example, He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. Um, and so these images that were given to Baal in the Canaanite mythology were taken and applied to the God of Israel. And yet in Daniel 7, they're applied to the Son of Man, a third reason to think that the Son of Man figure is, in, is himself deity. Let's look at um, to see whether there are any other divine figures. Um, the angel of the Lord, who I'm going to actually argue is actually one and the same person as the Messiah, but the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is represented as, as deity. For example, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 63, we read from verse 7 about the Israelites in the wilderness. God, um, the author is thinking back to the Israelites uh, in the wilderness, and he says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people children who, not, who will not deal falsely. And here we see God, of course, represented as a father to his people, Israel. So we have the father, and it goes on. He became their savior in all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. We'll come back to that in a moment. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Remember Psalm 78, 40, that they grieved Yahweh in the wilderness? Well, here that's uh, that's said to be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is therefore a divine person. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So therefore, we see that we have the Father, we have the Holy Spirit. But who is the angel of his presence? Uh, do we have any clues elsewhere in the Old Testament? Well, the answer is yes. First of all, though, let's look at the term melach. The term melach in Isaiah 63 is translated in our English Bibles as angel. The Greek equivalent word is angelos. Um, the meaning of melech, though, can, it could be translated an angelic creature, or it could also be translated simply messenger. It's used of human messengers. There's a table in this PhD dissertation by uh, Gunther uh, Junker, um, where it shows um, um, where the, the title melech is used not just of angelic beings, but also of human messengers. Um, so the term melech is not a technical term for angelic creature, but also has a broader meaning 
um, concerning uh, messengers, one who is sent. In Exodus 23.20, we have an allusion to this messenger of the presence. God says, Behold, I send an angel, a messenger before you to guard you on the way, to bring you to the place that I prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. My name is in him. He bears the very name of God himself. Um, and he will not pardon your transgression. What? He has the ability, the authority to forgive sins and indeed to withhold forgiveness. Um, this also comes out, uh, comes to light in Zechariah chapter 3, where the, the angel of the Lord is portrayed as removing the filthy garments from Joshua representing national Israel. And the angel of the Lord says to Joshua, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So the angel of the Lord claims authority to forgive sins, something that only Yahweh should be able to do. We see in the book of Genesis in chapter 18, um, also that uh, there's three men approach Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre and uh, they, they subsequently go off towards Sodom to meet Lot. But Abraham still stood before the Lord and one of those angels turns out to be the angel of the Lord because in Genesis 19.1 it says the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. So now we're down from three to two angels. So the Lord that Abraham stood to intercede with turns out to be one of the angels that appeared to him. In Genesis 19.24, it speaks about uh, Yahweh reigned on so Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. So you have Yahweh stood on earth in the person of the messenger of the Lord, and he's reigning sulfur, so, so, he's reigning, uh, sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. So you have two individuals there represented as Yahweh. It's not just me saying this. If we look at the, uh, the Aramaic translation, the Aramaic uh, Targum of Jonathan, he writes, um, and the word of the Lord himself, have made to descend upon the people of Sodom and Gomorrah showers of favor that they might work repentance from their wicked works. But when they saw showers of favor, they said, so our wicked works are not manifest before him. He, that is the word, turned then and caused to descend upon them bitumen and fire from before the Lord of the heavens. So it gives us some, a window of insight to how these texts were being understood by the original audiences. And then interestingly, every time throughout the rest of the Bible that Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned, Yahweh switches from speaking in the first person to speaking in the third person. Isaiah 13, 19, for example, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah um, when God overthrew them. Um, or Jeremiah 50 does the same thing. Or also Amos 4, verse 11, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we also see uh, the angel of the Lord presented as deity in various passages like Genesis 31, for example. Uh, the angel of God said to Jacob in the dream, Jacob, um, etc., and he says, I am the God of Bethel. In Genesis 35, again, we see this pattern of switching between first and third person. God said to Jacob, now it's Elohim there, plural form of God. God said to Jacob, arise, go to Bethel and dwell there, make an altar there to the God, singular El, singular form of God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So again, we see the plurality of God. This is one of my favorite examples in Genesis 48. Joseph, uh, Jacob is blessing the sons of Joseph. It says, Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my father is Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel or the messenger who has redeemed me from all evil, may he, singular pronoun, bless the boys. Finally then, Having shown the deity and personal distinctiveness of the angel of Yahweh, I want to show that the Messiah is in fact one and the same as the angel of Yahweh. I have several arguments for this, but I'll just give you one. Judges 2 verse 1 represents the angel of the Lord as the angel of the covenant. He's the one that delivered the covenant to the people of Israel. Um, in Malachi 3, though, we see that um, the angel of the covenant turns out to be the Messiah. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We've just seen that the messenger of the covenant is the angel of the Lord. And so, um, and also there's a connotation, there's a, it reminds us of Exodus 23.20, where you have the reverse of what's going on in Exodus 23.20, just as uh, um, an, uh, the angel of the Lord prepares the way for the Israelites. So now an Israelite is going to prepare the way for the angel of the Lord. Conclusions then. The Old Testament teaches a plurality of divine persons. The Old Testament teaches that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. The Old Testament teaches the Messiah is a divine person, that the angel of the Lord is a divine person, and the Messiah is the angel of the Lord. I'll finish with that. Thank you for your attention. I'll get uh, to the point. I'm a Christian Unitarian. I believe in the one God, the Father, 
the one God of the creed of Israel affirmed by Jesus Christ in Mark 12, 28. The Father is the only true God in John 17, 3. I believe in the one Lord Messiah, Jesus, who was supernaturally conceived as the Son of God and foreordained from the foundation of the world. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the personal, operational presence and power of God extended through the risen Christ to all believers. And just to note, I will be using the modern Greek pronunciation today. So Greek words may sound different from the Erasmian, what some call the Erasmian pronunciation that many are used to. So does the Old Testament teach? That means, does it show? Does it explain that there is, as my opponent uh, puts it in one of his articles, one being of God that is comprised of three eternal and co-equal divine persons? That's a quote from one of his articles. Well, what the Old Testament scriptures do show and explain clearly tens of thousands of times is that the one God of Israel, in Hebrew Elohim, Adonai, the divine name Yahweh, and in Greek Theos, is one person, the Father, a single self. A good follow-up to the debate question also has to be which trinity is taught in the Old Testament. Because there are many different versions and ways the Trinity continues to be described. Many Trinitarian scholars absolutely deny that any doctrine of the Trinity is taught in the Old Testament. So today I'll present three simple, hopefully simple points that demonstrate specific undeniable facts. One of which is that one, that most Trinitarian scholars admit it. It does not. Two, that biblical monotheism is not Trinitarian monotheism. And three, that the Old Testament texts prove a divine self and his human representative. So first, the scholars, the Encyclopedia of Religion, theologians today are in agreement that the Hebrew Bible does not contain a doctrine of the Trinity. Painting his critical history of the evolution of Trinitarianism, the idea that a trinity is to be found in the Old Testament is utterly without foundation. Fortman, an uh, evangelical Trinitarian, in his book, The Triune God, thus the Old Testament writings about God neither express nor imply any idea of or belief in a plurality or trinity of persons within the one Godhead. Even to see in them suggestions or foreshadowings or veiled signs of the trinity of persons is to go beyond the words and intent of the sacred writers. We have Harris in his famous Jesus as God book. It would be inappropriate for Elohim or Yahweh, the divine name, ever to refer to the Trinity in the Old Testament. Harper Collins Bible Dictionary. It would go far beyond the intention and thought forms of the Old Testament to suppose that a late fourth or 13th century Christian doctrine can be found there, that is in the Old Testament. So now to my second point, biblical monotheism and what's called Trinitarian monotheism. So my opponent brought up, obviously, the first and greatest, most important of all the commandments, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. So two things I'm going to focus here, simple things, I hope. Yahweh is a personal name that is denoting a single person. Murray Harris, again, being a proper noun in the covenant name of Israel's God, the divine name is invariably the name of a person who sustains relationships with other persons. This name is never used generically of deity, but always personally and individually of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So again, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. The word there translated one is from the Hebrew echad. It appears almost 1,000 times throughout the Hebrew scriptures. According to the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, it simply means a number. It occurs in phrases which compare one and two. So again, this means that we have one Yahweh in the Shema, one person, you cannot get three persons from one person. That's just impossible. The Old Testament Greek translation known as the LXX or the Septuagint verifies the nature of the Shema that is denoting, describing one single self, one individual. So here we have the Greek, Kyrios Oteos, Emon, Kyrios Is Estin. 
again, this is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So the phrase is esteen is the Greek simply to mean he is one, that is one person. That's what the Greek means. You can check any lexicon. We have Vincent's word studies. The masculine is, is one person. The noted Bruce Metzger, the famous textual critic of the 1950s to the 70s. In the masculine, the word, the Greek word for one is, means one numerically, one person. And whenever the word monos in Greek alone or only appears with the word God, theos or kyrios, which translates the Hebrew divine name, it obviously means one person. We have 2 Kings 19, you God, even you alone, you have made the heaven, the earth, and all things, Psalm 83, that they may know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh. We have Isaiah 37, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone. Isaiah 44, 24, a classic text. Yahweh, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am Yahweh, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who was with me. Yahweh, the true God, said these things. So I hope by now you have seen what it's what's known as the singular personal pronouns throughout the scriptures. In English, we have 14 forms of these. F I, me, myself, my, mine, his, etc. So there's a repeated clear accumulation of the singular personal pronouns because the Bible is simply talking about a single self, a single God. So you have he is one alone. No one, no one else can be the true God but Yahweh. We just read that. So who is Yahweh now should be the question. Let's see, Deuteronomy 32, is this the way you repay Yahweh, foolish and unwise people? Isn't he your father who has bought you? Isaiah 63, for you are our father, though Abraham doesn't know us, Israel does not acknowledge us. You, Yahweh, are our father. We have Chronicles 29, blessed are you, Yahweh, the God of Israel, our father from eternity to eternity. Malachi 1.6, if I am a father, then where's my honor? Says Yahweh of armies. And then the famous Malachi 2.10, do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? And then you have a plethora, many other verses. Now, my last point, the Old Testament texts. Psalm 110 verse 1, one of the most cited texts by the New Testament writers, it defines who is who. It talks about the Lord, with the divine name there, says to my Lord, so the Lord God, one person, one single self, is speaking to someone who is not God. And the word there is Ladoni, Brown Driver Briggs. Adonai and Adoni are variations of pointing to distinguish divine reference from human. The Englishman's Hebrew concordance of the Old Testament, the generally accepted fact, is that the Masoretic pointing distinguishes divine references, Adonai, from human references, Adoni. Now, the point here is that the divine name, the so-called tetragram, the four letters, are uh, told to us as Adonai in the Hebrew scriptures. And the point here is that these are Trinitarian uh, scholars, Trinitarian books, just reading the text and what it says, and Adonai is never Adoni. Adoni does not mean deity. Further proof, Adoni, my Lord, appears almost 200 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And it's always used for humans. Abraham, Esau, Saul, David, Elijah, king of Assyria. Occasionally for angels. It's never a title for God. It, the LXX, again, the Old Testament Greek translation verifies the Hebrew Masoretic. So here we have, in Greek, the Hebrew name, the divine name, is translated, as we said, Kyrios, and this is clearly distinguished from Adoni, Kyrios Mu, which means my Lord, every other time. So here we have all the references that you can look at. Ladoni is the phrase, the full phrase used in Psalm 110, verse 1. To my Lord, Ladoni, and that's translated by the Greek as tokiriomu, 
which again is a phrase that it is never applied to deity. It never means God. Abraham, Esau, Saul, David, Elijah, the Assyrian king, it's never applied to deity. Now, is, is Psalm 110 verse 1 the only exception? So in other words, do we really have Adonai speaking to Adonai? You have to question that in light of the clear evidence of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. Now let's look at the last proof, uh, Old Testament text, Daniel 7. So here are the very important verses, the most used passage in the New Testament, by the way. So I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He appeared, sorry, he approached the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. Now I'm gonna focus here on the title or the phrase son of man in contrast to the ancient of days and note there that the figure of the ancient of days that we all know is god the one yahweh gives authority to this figure called the son of man now what does the son of man mean well it never means deity son of man is simply a way of saying a human being in this case the human being that is the messiah by the way the messiah means the anointed one of yahweh of god so how can you have an anointed yahweh ask yourselves that numbers 33 is the classic text we all know god is not a man a son of man that is a human being you have also extra biblical works sirach for all things cannot be in man because the son of man is not immortal in other words we're not inherently immortal we must die and again, note that in this passage in Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days stands in clear contrast to the human he gives authority to. And just as a side note, which is very important, Son of Man is never an angel. A human is never an angel. So to sum up, there are close to 1,000 occurrences of the word one, meaning not more than one in the Hebrew scriptures. 11,000 occurrences of the word God in its various forms, the Hebrew Adonai, Elohim, the Greek Theos, not one of which can be shown to mean a triune. This is because the scriptures clearly teach that the person of Yahweh cannot be at the same time, three separate distinct persons. This would be sheer contradiction. A doctrine is defined as a set of beliefs based on teachings. The Trinity fails because it is not taught in the, in the Old Testament. It's never shown, it's never explained. This is further exposed when one is told to depart from the laws of language and logic itself as the evangelical and Dr. Millard Erickson in his book, God in Three Person himself witnesses. He says in reference to the Trinity, it may also be necessary to utilize logically odd language. This means using language in such a way as intentionally to commit grammatical errors. Thus, I have sometimes said of the Trinity, he are three or they is one. So, are you willing to continue to try and understand something that puts you at risk of losing your mind? Yet, if you deny it, as the old warning says, you will lose your soul? From Moses to the prophets, to the kings of Israel, Yahweh is the only one who is the God and Father of us all. This is clear throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. We have Deuteronomy 32. Look now, I myself am he. There is no other God but me. Numbers 12, 8. I speak to Moses face to face, clearly, and not in mysteries. He sees Yahweh as he is. Psalm 55. God, he who is from before the ages, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them because they have no fear of God. Again, 1 Kings. Let these words of mine with which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel. The Lord is God, there is no other. Jeremiah 32. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. My people have turned their back to me. Let's listen carefully. Though I taught them teaching again and again, they would not listen and receive instruction. So either these words are true, or we're dealing with a God who is perpetrating a massive deception here. If God wanted you and me to know that he is three persons, why would he consistently use such language? Instead, he clearly 
directly teaches throughout the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures in this case, that he is one single divine person. You will recall in my opening statement, I offered five lines of argumentation for the doctrine of the Trinity being present in the Old Testament. Just to remind you what those were, I argued one, that the Hebrew scriptures teach a plurality of divine persons. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Thirdly, the Messiah is a divine person. Fourthly, the angel of the Lord is a divine person. And fifthly, the Messiah is the angel of the Lord. That is to say that the Messiah and the angel of the Lord are one and the same person. Now, now, um, in listening to Carlos's opening statement, um, I was uh, uh, disappointed, actually, that it, was, it, it seemed uh, to me, at least, to be quite weak in its argumentation. Uh, let's just address some of the points that were brought up. Um, he mentioned that the Old Testament teaches that God is one person. The Father. Um, I would disagree because of the evidences I adduced in my opening presentation, which uh, Carlos has not engaged with, um, and to the extent that he did engage with the Son of Man passage, we'll come to that uh, when we get there. Um, he said, uh, which, uh, trini which version of the Trinity is taught in the Old Testament? I, th I think uh, that, uh, that the Old Testament clearly teaches monotheism, and it clearly uh, ascribes the titles and prerogatives and attributes of deity to three distinct individual persons. Um, and, uh, I, well, yet affirming monotheism. That is the classic understanding of, uh, of the Trinity. Obviously, the Old Testament authors and writers and figures did not have the same philosophical categories that we've come to associate with Nicene Trinitarianism, but certainly the roots of, of Trinitarian theology are very much present in the Old Testament. Um, he said that uh, lots of uh, Trinitarian scholars deny that any form of the Trinity is taught in the Old Testament. Well, I would disagree with those scholars, so um, I, I, I'd rather um, encourage Carlos to engage with what I've argued in my opening presentation. Um, he mentioned uh, he mentioned about scholars rejecting that um, that uh, the um, that the doctrine of the Trinity is present in the Old Testament. Um, I would point him in the direction of um, the ancient Jews who actually did uh, have a concept of divine plurality in the Old Testament. Um, there's a book that came out uh, uh, quite a number of years ago um, by Alan Siegel, who is not a Christian but a Jewish. Uh, writer, and he uh, he write he, his book is called the Two Powers in Heaven, and basically he talks about the fact that uh, that a concept of divine plurality within the one essence of God was actually quite common in the in ancient Judaism. It was later classed as a as a heresy, but it was not classed as a heresy until um, until the second century CE. Um, and he writes, and I'm quoting, the basic heresy involved inter uh, interpreting scripture to say that a principal angelic or hypostatic manifestation in heaven was equivalent to God. Um, and it was passages like Daniel 7 and various other texts uh, uh, that are in the Old Testament that led to this view. Um, and now, as I said, it wasn't a class as a heresy until after Christianity and possibly as a response or reaction to uh, Christianity. Um, and if you look at the ancient writers, uh, we see uh, hints of this view. For example, um, Philo of Alexandria, who is a Jewish philosopher in the first century, um, writes about the so-called divine logos. Um, and uh, for example, uh, I'm quoting here, he says, um, that God sustained the universe to rest firm and sure upon the mighty Logos, who is my viceroy. Uh, he says in Confusion of Tongues that the Logos is that power of his God, by w um, uh, sorry, that, the, uh, the Logos is that power of, hi of his, namely God, by which he made and ordered all things. Um, he, uh, um, and not only is God between the two primary powers, but so is the Logos, uh, Philo tells us. He says um, in Cherubim, he says, while God is indeed one, his highest and chief powers are two, even goodness and sovereignty. And in the midst between the two, there is a third which unites them, the Logos. For it is through the Logos that God is both ruler and good. Of these two powers, sovereignty and goodness, the cherubim are the symbols, as fiery sword is a symbol of the Logos. And so um, this, of course, is uh, part of the background, the backdrop to John's theology in his, John, in, in his gospel, where he identifies Jesus, of course, as that divine Logos, which is firmly rooted in the Old Testament. I mean, it, uh, the, the Aramaic term is Memra, the, and the Aramaic Targums are absolutely... Uh, um, dripping with the symbolism of the so-called uh, memra of the Lord, um, which is the word of God, which is uh, 
um, which is also equated with the angel of the Lord. Um, you see this, for example, in Targum Azudur Jonathan uh, in the Pentateuch, in, in the Pentateuch um, when uh, it's, it's, by the way, the Aramaic Targums are basically an Aramaic paraphrase of the Old Testament text, and it's kind of an interpretive translation. Um, in, Gen in the translation in the Targum Azudur Jonathan of Genesis 16, when the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar, it says um, that she gave thanks before the Lord whose word spoke to her. Um, and then uh, later it says that she prayed in the name of the word of the Lord who had been manifested to her, um, saying, blessed be thou, uh, Eloha, the living one of all ages, um, who has looked upon my um, affliction. So um, there's um, ample evidence, I think, from the Targums and from other ancient authors and authorities that there was, a, there was indeed room for a concept of divine plurality, which stemmed directly from the Old Testament texts. Um, uh, he mentioned uh, biblical, his second point was biblical monotheism. He mentioned Deuteronomy 6.4, which I also alluded to in my own presentation. Uh, and as, as I said in my own presentation, I'll repeat now, um, ICAD doesn't compel you to accept uh, a compound or composite unity in all, in all cases, but it allows for it, accommodates it. Um, Yahid, which refers to a solitary unity, would not allow for that, but ICAD most certainly does. And I give examples in my opening presentation. I'm happy to give more. Um, he says that ICAD means a number and it occurs in phrases that compare one and two. Well, sure, it, we, we believe there's one God, but his complexion is unity. We, we're not, we're not tri-theists, we're Trinitarians. Um, so we believe that there's one God, but he's a complex unity, um, and that is uh, consistent with both the Old and New Testaments. Um, he said that uh, Yahweh is a personal name, thus indicating a single person, and yet the title of Yahweh is actually applied in both the Old and New Testaments to more than one individual. Um, he says, what about the singular pronouns in the Old Testament, um, like uh, when it refers to the God of Israel as he? Um, I mean, let me give you an example, uh, a kind of example for this. There's actually several that I could give you. This, this one is from Psalm 130 where actually singular pronouns are used of the nation of Israel. Um, it says in verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his singular pronoun iniquities. And so the singular pronoun is used of a corporate entity like Israel, and so I think that it could be used in a similar way of God. Uh, he mentioned uh, Psalm 110, which is also one of my favorite passages, um, and he mentioned along the lines of what Sir Anthony Buzzard often likes to point out, that uh, Adoni in verse 1 is, is uh, not a title for God. God. Um, I, um, the title Adonai does not necessarily denote deity, um, that's completely correct, but I would contest his uh, claim that it never, it never in the Old Testament refers to God. For example, in, jo in Joshua chapter 5, when uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua um, and uh, in verses 13 through 15, it says, when Joshua was by Jericho, uh, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, rather I yes. indeed come now as the captain of the Lord, of, of, uh, of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Again, using that term Adoni. Um, and we can show that the, that the angel of the Lord in that context is very clearly deity because um, uh, he's commanded to remove his sandals for the place he's standing is holy, just as Moses was. Um, and there's very striking parallels to, um, to um, Exodus 3, where the angel of the Lord appears in the burning bush as Yahweh. Um, he, uh, he also mentioned, uh, and also the, the sword drawn in his hand, uh, which of course reminds us of the angel of the Lord appearing to, to uh, Balaam as well. Uh, you mentioned Daniel 7. And he said that the son of, title son of man never means deity. Um, and he gives the example of uh, Numbers 23, 19. God is uh, not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. Son of man has a number of different uh, contexts in which it's used. It's used in Ezekiel. It's used there in Numbers 23, 19. And it's used various other places. But here it's speaking about particular son of man, namely the messianic son of man. It's not just any old son of man. And this particular son of man is, in fact, a divine person. Uh, but also human, of course, but he's, but he's also divine for the reasons that I gave in my opening presentation, which Carlos, I'm afraid, did not address. Um, he says that the Ancient of Days stands in clear contrast to the human he gives authority to. Well, yes, we're not unitary, we're not modalists, we're Trinitarians, right? We distinguish between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We think they're different, distinctive personalities. Um, he says that a human is never an angel, and as I said in my opening statement, Melach, 
um, is, a t- is can be translated angel and also messenger. Even the name Malachi means my messenger, right? It's the possessive form of Malach. Um, in Malachi 3, speaking of what we understand as John the Baptist, it uses the term Malach, the messenger who prepares the way for the messenger of the covenant to come to his temple. All right. Thank you. I cannot address points in my opening statement just uh, for the viewers out there. So it's not that I don't want to address them, but I'll address some of them now. So let's begin with the infamous, uh, what I call infamous compound one or complex one or different different terms. So the noun doesn't change the singular meaning of echad. Echad is one. That's how you count in Hebrew. So the often uh, brought up one flesh. It's not two fleshes. It's still one flesh. One cluster of grapes. It's not two clusters of grapes. Uh, two are better than one, says Ecclesiastes. Not two better than two. Abraham was one person, not two persons, etc. The word one retains its meaning. It means one flesh, not two fleshes, etc. The Jewish views of the Son of Man, by the way, were never that the Son of Man was deity there. That would make two Yahwehs. So it was either the nation of Israel, signified by the people of the Holy One, or the other view was obviously the one Christians later held, the Jewish Christians, the human Messiah. And you have books like Enoch 46, Babylonian Talmud, uh, the uh, Rabbi Rashi, that is the King Messiah. Again, think about what the word Messiah means, by the way. It means anointed one of Yahweh, of God. Uh, the Son of Man is worshipped as deity. The Aramaic for worship there, yes, it's true. The Aquila text, the Greek translation, has latrevo. I'm using the modern G- uh, Greek again, latrevo. But also the Theodosian has duleo, which is a general term to serve. We have two competing uh, translations here, but even... If the Son of Man is given latrevo, understood as sacred worship, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 48 of the LXX, it uses latrevo for the enemies of Israel. You shall serve latrevo, your enemies, whom Yahweh shall send against you. So are the enemies of Israel deity? In the Targums, uh, as, uh, as he stated, the commentaries of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Aramaic for worship, palak, is used for the nations as well as individuals. And note that in Daniel 7, the Son of Man and the saints both receive worship and the eternal kingdom. So you find in Daniel 7, verse 27, many translations there have, and they shall serve them, that is the saints of the Most High God. Many translations do that. I think there's also an argument here that somehow shared titles or shared imagery means that you are a deity, you are God. I don't think so. You can have shared titles with someone, but it doesn't make you that someone. An example is Elijah is taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, says Second Kings 2, for example. He's in the clouds. He's, uh, some translations have uh, in a, a, cloud, a chariot of clouds, for example. Just because he shares that imagery of being on the clouds uh, doesn't mean he's deity. And again, Daniel 7, God gives, the Ancient of Days gives an everlasting kingdom. And that's also said about the saints, again, in Daniel 7, verses 18, 22, and 27. It said about the Davidic king's kingdom, your throne is forever, in Psalm 45, verse 6. It said about David himself in Psalm 89, 29. And it said by, to, about Solomon in 2 Samuel 7, 13. And another interesting text here in in reference to worship is Isaiah 45, 14, where Israel is worshipped, not only worshipped, but prayed to the subjugated nations in the future, of course. Now, let's see the second person uh, here as the angel. Deity is never an angel. An angel is a messenger of someone. Again, I think we're confusing here the sent one with the one that is sending the messenger with the principle. The idea actually of angels taking on human flesh is is a quite heretical view in the Bible. So for example, here you have the situation of the Nephilim in Genesis 6. You have other apostolic age works where this idea of angels taking on flesh, heresy, and an interesting one from Origen, even in the fourth century where Origen taught that the Baptist was an angel who became incarnate 
to be the precursor of Christ. The angel is the messenger of the Lord, are also prophets. Prophets are the messenger of the Lord. So is the prophet Haggai the second person of the Trinity? Because he's called the messenger of the Lord. This is the same Hebrew phrase, by the way. Uh, Malachi 2.7, the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. After all, he's the messenger of the Lord who rules over all. And people seek instruction from his mouth. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the angel of the Lord. You can check the Hebrew there that that is a translator's prerequisite to translate it either as the angel angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord. You have second Esdras one, I will give to the people as leaders. And then it lists the patriarchs and prophets. And then it calls Malachi the messenger of the Lord. And by the way, the name Malachi means my messenger. Angels cannot be the seed of a human being. That's Genesis 3.15. Uh, angels are not raised up. That's the prophet in Deuteronomy 18. The angels are not created from the womb. This is the prophecy about this messianic figure that we all know as Christians. In Psalm 49 and Psalm 110 verse 3, in the Greek translation, an angel cannot be a lineal blood relative of David. That's Psalm 132. An angel cannot be the shoot or offspring of Yahweh. That would be ridiculous to have two Yahwehs and one is described as the shoot of the other. The prophecies here about the Messiah obviously contradict that the Messiah somehow pre-existed as the angel of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord, he talked about the spirit being grieved and so on. Well, uh, our spirits are grieved, for example. Second Samuel 13, but he would not grieve the spirit of Amnon, his son. You see there, Second Samuel 13, the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom. Spirits can be grieved. Uh, I don't hold the uh, Jehovah's Witness view that the spirit is, is not personal. The spirit is always personal because it, it comes from a human, a person, sorry, a human being, or it can be the spirit of God himself. So it's not impersonal. The spirit is always personal. It always comes from a person. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, could we begin with um, Zechariah 2? Could you give your interpretation of Zechariah 2 in response to what I said in my opening statement concerning it? It seems to indicate that Yahweh has been sent by Yahweh. How would you right. interpret that within your view? That would be two Yahwehs, one Yahweh too many according to the Shema. In the Bible, in the Hebrew scriptures, and this is well known, God can speak of himself in the third person. Uh, so that's how I see it. That's how most uh, scholars see it, by the way. Yes, I, I agree that Yahweh can speak of himself in the third person. But in, in Zechariah 2, he says, uh, um, he says three times that he has been sent by Yahweh. Does that not indicate to you that Yahweh is multi-personal? No, it's indicating the way you're reading it that there are two Yahwehs. It's there are two persons identified by the name of Yahweh, which is right. consistent with my view, but not consistent with your view. The view that the two Yahwehs make one Yahweh is not in, in the Hebrew scriptures. It's nowhere in the Bible. I'm asking how you interpret this text. <laughs> like I said, uh, I think God is speaking of himself in the third person. Yahweh, the, the father, is speaking of himself in the third person. Okay, so when he says, um, when he says that many nations should join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, this is verse 11, and you yep. shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, is Yahweh not saying there that he's been sent by Yahweh? Uh, it's not another person, like I said. I, uh, then you will know that the Lord who rules over all has sent me to you. And, right. and is Yahweh speaking? It's very clearly Yahweh speaking because he says he's going to dwell in the midst of his people, and he's been sent by Yahweh to dwell in the midst of his people. So right. does that not indicate a divine plurality? Uh, no. Again, I have to go back to the use of the third of the third person here. But, it's, but this isn't a third person issue. He's simply saying, you know, he's speaking in the first person here. He's saying, I have been sent by Yahweh. That's what the text very clearly says three times. Right. In verse 10, it says, sing out and be, I'm using the net Bible, by the way. Uh, Zion, my daughter, for look, I have come, I will settle in your midst, says the Lord. And then verse 11, many nations will join themselves to the Lord on the day on the day of salvation, they will also be my people. There's more than one person in this text identified as Yahweh, which is consistent with the Trinitarian paradigm, not consistent with a Unitarian paradigm. Right. I, I understand you're reading this literally. I'm not. I don't, I'm not because reading. How are you reading it? Like I just said, it's the Lord God speaking of himself in the third person. You said uh, that... Uh, that uh, deity is never an angel. And of course, I'd remind you that, um, as I pointed out, 
uh, melach, which is the, the term that's translated as angel, can also be used as messenger. You rightly pointed out that Malachi is a possessive form, meaning my messenger. When you said that deity is never an angel, or I presume they're never a messenger, what do you make then of in Malachi chapter 3, when it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he prepared the way before me, and had at dawn the Lord whom you seek, a title only ever used of Yahweh, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Here the Lord of hosts, the had at dawn the Lord God himself, is called the messenger of the covenant. Is that not where deity is called a messenger? Let's say I'm about to send my messenger, who will clear the way before me, before God, indeed, the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant, whom you long for, is certainly coming. Yep, that, that's Yahweh, yep. Yep, that's, that's Yahweh, so we agree on that. But he's called Melach there, and you said in your presentation that me, the, t the term messenger or angel is never used of Yahweh, but there's an example where it is. Well, I don't think any scholar would say that. Uh, all I see here... Yes, they do. Scholars do say that. Again, all I see here is that Yahweh will come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant. I believe actually that's Jesus. Yeah, I believe it's Jesus too. But right. it, but here he's identified as Ha'adon. So this points to the deity of Christ. It points away from the Unitarian view. Well, there's a prophecy. Exactly. Uh, of, of Right, it's a future. It's, it's exactly its future. And it's right. saying that, that Ha'adon, the Lord <laughs> God himself, is a messenger who is going to come to his temple. But you said that the term messenger is never used of Yahweh. But here's an example where the term messenger of the covenant is used of Yahweh. Actually, it's used of the Messiah. Yeah, it's, it's used of the Messiah, who is God, right? Uh, I don't believe you can be an anointed God any less than you can be an anointed Yahweh. So here the messenger in a prophetic sense will be that Messiah. That's how I'm reading it. Um, I know I agree. I can re agree completely with you that it's the Messiah, but do you not see that he's called Ha'adon, a title only ever used of Yahweh? Right, so these are Yahweh texts applied to this future uh, Messiah figure. Which would indicate that the Messiah is Yahweh, right? If, if these texts are, if this is a Yahweh text where it's saying that the Messiah is Yahweh, would that not entail that Jesus is Yahweh? I think the Messiah represents the one Yahweh, just That's like the says. angel represents the, the one Yahweh. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, let's let's discuss that then. Um, said that the, the 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 messenger of Yahweh only represents Yahweh; he isn't Yahweh himself. Um, let's go over to um, give many texts here that would refute this. Let's go to Judges thirteen. Judges thirteen. Uh, Manoah and his wife encountered the angel of the Lord, the male like Yahweh, and it says. Um, so verse 21, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. This is when he's ascended in the flame towards heaven at the altar. The Manoah knew that he was the Melach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. Gideon has a similar reaction in Judges 6. Jacob has a similar reaction in Genesis 32, etc. Hagar has a similar reaction in Genesis 16. And, and there's, there's several others as well. Um, does the fact that they, they, they say that we've seen the face of God, therefore we shall surely die, not indicate that in their view, the angel of the Lord that they've just seen is Yahweh? I don't think so, or else they would have died on the spot. Except for the fact that, uh, right. it, that the term God and the angel of the Lord are used interchangeably in various passages. Um, and uh, Isaiah in Isaiah 6 sees mm -hmm. the Lord seated in the throne in the temple. The point is that there's a distinction in the Old Testament between the seen and the unseen Yahweh. As John 1.18 says, no one has ever seen God, but the monogamous theos, God the one and only, he has sure. made him known, or he has explained him to us. Likewise, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the visible Yahweh. He then reveals the invisible Yahweh. So that's re very consistent with my view, but it seems that it's not consistent with your view. Right. I don't, I don't take those literally, those uh, so-called theophanies literally, or else uh, those people had to die then. If, if Isaiah saw literally Yahweh on his throne, he had to die. That's, on, we agreed yeah, that... that, that yeah, that would be the Unitarian view. My view is that uh, the that just as in the New Testament, the Messiah reveals Yahweh. Um, so in the Old Testament, uh, uh, the mouthpiece of Yahweh, the Word of Yahweh, actually in the Aramaic Targum, he's specifically called the Word of Yahweh. And there's there's text in the Old Testament that get to that as well. It, that's that suggests that. Um, that he is the, the mouthpiece of Yahweh, the revelation of Yahweh, the unique revelation of Yahweh to mankind, that he is God, and yet he's, you've got the seen versus the unseen Yahweh. But let's move on to another text. Um, let's go to Genesis 48, which I alluded to earlier in my opening mm -hmm. statement. This is when Jacob is blessing his, uh, the sons of Joseph, and he says in verse 16, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil bless the boys. Uh, or, or, so it says in, in verse 15, that God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac oh, walked, 
on my life long to this day. The Sorry. angel who's redeeming me from all evil, may he bless <clears> the boys, use the singular pronoun. Does that not indicate that God of Israel and the angel are one and the same? That indicates to me that the angel has been given authority to bless. The angel has been given authority to strike, to destroy. And the angel, once again, I think uh, I cannot confuse the messenger with the one that's sending the messenger. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, Jonathan, the first uh, verse is there. These are the words, uh, 29, 1, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel. Verse 2, Moses summoned all Israel, said to them, in verse 5, Moses says, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. And then in verse 6, Moses says, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, your God. And then in verse 10, you shall stand to them today all of you before the lord your god this is moses speaking how do you understand that passage uh so in in that context he's report he's reporting you know the the speech of god at the end verse six it seems to me Mos moses here it says he summoned all israel and said to them you have seen all the lord did before so I, th I think there he's actually reporting the speech of god do we agree that in verse six moses says i am the lord your god no yes. i think no no I, I think that he's reporting the speech of God throughout that entire text. All right. And then in verse 10, he says that they are before the Lord your God. Now they're before Moses. So Moses is not the Lord God here, the Lord your God. Right. They're standing before um, before the Lord your God. That, that's correct. Um, right. That's the, Moses, right? Standing no. before them? No, no I, don't, I, don't think this, I don't think the referent here is Moses. I think he's speaking about the Lord God. Okay, uh, let's move ahead to the compound one issue. So mm -hmm. are you saying one, a had, is more than one? So no, I'm not. I'm saying that one, that a had can, doesn't always, but can refer to a composite or compound unity. And I gave examples of that, that, um, that uh, uh, um, man and woman you know, become one flesh. Um, I use the, the Hebrew word a cad there. Um, so okay. it's, it's a compound or composite unity in the way that... I, you know, it, as a Trinitarian, I don't think I, I think that God is one in one sense as to being, but as a complex or compl compound unity, one as to being, three as to person. So another question: Do you agree that the name Yahweh applies to each one, each person of the of the Trinity, and to the Trinity as a whole? Yes, I do. Okay, so you have the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Spirit is Yahweh, correct? Mm -hmm. And that equals one what? Yahweh. So uh, I think we have th we have three divine persons who are each singularly Yahweh and also collectively Yahweh. Okay, but so now you're saying there are three Ys. Let's call them three Ys equals one Y. Is that what you're saying? No, it's just that the the ter the title Yahweh is applied in equal measure to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and is um, is also used of. Um, all three persons collectively as well. Uh, right. That's just the way that Scripture uses the terms. There's numerous passages in both the Old and New Testament where that's the case. Right, and and that doesn't. I mean, that's a sounds like a. You can't have that. That's a contra That's three Y's equals one Y. Is that right? It's, the Trinity it, is three persons equals one uh, what? One being. Is that correct? Three persons equals one divine being. The title right. Yahweh is used of Father, Son, and Spirit individually, and it's also okay. used of the divine being. So you have three persons equals one being, and you also believe three Yahwehs equals one Yahweh. Right. Okay. Uh, to move on here, how does the Old Testament teach? Let's go back to the debate question. How does the Old Testament teach, and teaching means showing and explaining, the Trinity when you repeatedly talk about hints and clues uh, in the Old Testament, so, so this is only hinted at in that there are there are three in the Old Testament, as I made plain in my opening statement, there are the, the Old Testament clearly teaches divine plurality that there's one divine being consisting of multiple divine persons, and that there's three divine persons, namely the Father, His Angel, or the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. Um, that's, uh, I, I'm not arguing that the same philosophical categories that we find in the Nicene Creed are found in the Old Testament, but certainly the, um, it, I, I think that you have the makings of the Trinity there. But we do agree that teaching means shown and explaining, and is so the Trinity is not shown or, or explained as, think, as the word teaching defines, is that right? I, I, I think there are texts which make sense only in view of a Trinitarian paradigm. I don't think it, I don't think it says, okay, here's the doctrine of the Trinity and gives you a Nicene Creed, um, but I've never argued that. Okay, so you don't have a verse as you believe three Yahwehs equals one Yahweh. There's no one verse? 
in the Hebrew uh, I wouldn't scriptures? Say, I wouldn't say a single verse, no. And is there a passage? Oh, yeah. Where it, where it I, says sure. three Yahwehs equals one Yahweh? Um, there's, there's plenty. Um, I gave uh, an example well, in my opening you, statement. It was you, 63, for example. Right. You, uh, you see multiple Yahwehs. You see right? multiple individuals identified as Yahweh, yeah. Right. But do we ever have three Yahwehs equals one Yahweh? There, there's no one verse you, you just said. I said there's not one verse, but why do you okay. need just one verse? Okay, uh, so let's stick with the hints and clues. So if this is only hinted at, and we only have clues in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, are there any Trinitarians in the Old Testament? Did anyone get it at all? The patriarchs, any prophet, any king? Um, I think that they, I, I, as I said, I don't think that they had the same philosophical categories of Nicene Trinitarian Christianity. Obviously not. Um, so, so was that a no? Did, did, they, did they believe in multiple persons what? within Yahweh. And, and yes, I, th I think that there were the ancient writers, uh, including in the Aramaic Targumim, show um, clearly a view of divine plurality, where there is um, at least two and arguably three. Right. Uh, persons. right. But that's not what I'm asking. Is there any Trinitarian in the Old Testament? Prophet? King? That's what you mean by Trinitarian. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so I read uh, one of the texts, Moses knew God face to face. However, we want to understand face to face. Moses... Uh, knew God face to face. Uh, you have uh, the friends of God, Noah, and so on. So these people never got it that that Yahweh is really three Yahwehs. Um, what's your text you're referring to there? Uh, the text I uh, sorry, uh, where Moses knew God face to face. Or so my my point is though. My question is: mm. This man who knew Moses knew God intimately. Can we agree? Yeah. Okay, but Moses never saw, uh, never was a Trinitarian. Basically, is my question. Well, again, it depends what you mean by Trinitarian. Um, obviously, they didn't have Nicene cat philosophical categories, but I, okay. um, as, as for him seeing Yahweh face to face, um, you, at, in Exodus 23, as I mentioned earlier, you have the angel, the messenger, who prepares the way before the children of Israel. In chapter 24, it says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. This referring to the angel of the Lord there in the third person as Yahweh. Um, um, when they see the angel, who you believe is literally Yahweh, how do you know? How do you know that it's the Father, the Son, or the Spirit there? How do we know which person is is being? Looked um, at? Because the uh, angel of the Lord is identified as the Messiah. I have several arguments, but I gave one of my opening statement, which I'll repeat, which is um, Malachi three, verse one. Um, identifies the messenger of the covenant as the Messiah. The messenger of the covenant in Judges two, verse one, is identified as um, right, the angel. But it but it's not in the text. The text is not telling you which of the persons it is in the Hebrew scriptures when they see um, an angel in Judges and so on. I think it can be inferred. Okay, inferred. Uh, well, thank you again, Carlos, for participating in this debate. And thank you for you, the audience, for uh, engaging uh, in the chat and for uh, interacting with us and coming to listen to what we have to say to represent these different perspectives. Uh, you'll recall in my opening statement that I laid out five basic arguments to establish my contention, my thesis this evening. Um, the first argument was that the Hebrew scriptures teach a plurality of divine persons. Um, Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Thirdly, the Messiah is a divine person. Fourthly, the angel of the Lord is a divine person. And fifthly, the Messiah is the angel of the Lord. Now, um, as to the first point, um, I think we saw quite clearly that Carlos was unable to explain uh, texts like Zechariah 2. I would love to cross-examine him on some of these other divine plurality passages as well. Um, but I, I think that he did not provide us with a satisfactory explanation for Zechariah 2, um, which clearly... Uh, affirms a plurality of divine persons that Yahweh says no less than three times in that passage, in that short passage, that he has been sent by Yahweh. Um, and so I, I think that uh, that argument um, stood quite uh, robustly. Um, on my second uh, contention, the Holy Spirit is a, is a divine person. Uh, he pointed out that, um, that, they, that he Quite, is, is quite happy to affirm that the Holy Spirit is a personal agency. I'm glad to hear that. Um, however, he seemed to miss the point um, regarding the Holy Spirit uh, that I was trying to make. Um, he, uh, he, um, I mentioned the connection between Isaiah 63 and Psalm 7840, where Yahweh is grieved in the wilderness. Um, I have also mentioned in my opening statement numerous passages which clearly ascribe divine titles, prerogatives, attributes to the Holy Spirit. For example, I mentioned uh, Psalm 104, verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, uh, they are created and renew the face of the ground. Um, there's other passages which speak about the role of the Holy Spirit in creation. Uh, there's um, 
uh, passages that speak of the omnipotence, om omnipresence, omniscience of the Holy Spirit. These are characteristics of deity. So the Holy Spirit then seems to be a divine person. Um, I don't think that Carlos satisfactorily addressed uh, my argument on that point. So I think that um, my second argument uh, stood quite robustly as well. As for my third um, uh, argument, I argue that the Messiah is uh, a divine person. Um, here, I would have liked to have uh, had more engagement on on the passages that came up on that. Uh, the only one that he really uh, tried to engage with was uh, Daniel 7, where uh, he says that uh, the Son of Man never means deity. And as I pointed out, uh, the title Son of Man can be used in a number of different ways and uh, contexts. It's used in Ezekiel. It's used in, as he mentioned, uh, Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie on the Son of Man that he should change his mind. But uh, there's a a specific way in which the term son of man is being used in Daniel 7. Jesus, of course, as Carlos agrees, identified himself as that Danielic son of man. And the son of man, for the three reasons I gave among others, identifies himself as, um, as um, a divine, as, is identified by Daniel as a divine person. Um, I, I pointed out uh, the connection to Daniel 6.26. I pointed out um, that he receives worship, etc. He mentioned um, that the uh, and, and also the fact that he rides the clouds. He, uh, Carlos mentioned uh, that uh, the Hebrew says in, in Daniel 7.27 that uh, that um, this kingdom, uh, that, his kingdom is never, uh, that when it says all powers shall serve and obey them, but in the Greek Septuagint translation, actually, interestingly, it gives us some insight into the in, into what how this was being understood by the translators of the Septuagint. It says, In the kingdom and the power and the greatness of the kings that are under the whole heaven were given to the saints of the Most High, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all people powers shall serve and obey him. So it's often said by contemporary Jews, not ancient Jews, but modern Jews, that the Son of Man is actually the nation of Israel, um, and sometimes they try to use that, that um, argument. Um, but I think contextually, for reasons I could get into in more detail, the Son of Man is not national Israel. He's not a personification of national Israel, um, but he's actually a representative of national Israel as an individual person. Um, and I, I, um, Daniel 7.27, I think when read properly, actually um, affirms uh, that interpretation. Um, even if we stick with the Aramaic, which is slightly more ambiguous than the Greek Septuagint, and take verse 27 to refer to the plural them, as some translators render it, as Carlos pointed out, the Aramaic word used in verse 27 for most high, Elonin, is in the plural and literally means most highs or highest ones. Um, and in context, the most high in verse 27 clearly refers uh, to God. Um, so uh, that was the only text, really. He mentioned... Uh, Psalm 110 as well, I guess, which also deals with the Messiah. And he pointed out that Adonai is never used as the title of, of uh, deity. I pointed out that's not true. And I showed him Joshua 5, where it is used of the angel of the Lord who's identified in that context as Yahweh, especially by its uh, connection with Exodus 3 and the burning bush uh, episode. Um, I would also point out that in verse 5 of Psalm 110, uh, the one seated at Yahweh's right hand is identified as Adonai. I know Sir Anthony Buzzard, who's in the audience today, likes to um, argue that, uh, that that's actually just a reversal of uh, verse 1, just as, um, as David's Lord sits at the right hand of, of Yahweh, so uh, Yahweh sits at the right hand of David's Lord. Um, I think this, is, this interpretation is incorrect. Um, for a number of reasons, one of those being that if we read it uh, carefully and we continue uh, reading, uh, uh, we, we read in verse, uh, 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 the, what continues from verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand, so Adonai is at your right hand, which I argue interprets verse 1 as Adonai. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. These, he's are, these pronoun he's are all referring back to verse 5, Adonai. Um, he will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. So he drinks from a brook, a human function. And so I think that verse 5 um, actually illuminates for us verse 1 of Psalm 110, identifying uh, the one seated at Yahweh's right hand as a divine person. I think it also, by the way, connects with uh, Daniel 7, where um, there are thrones set in place in the lead up to the Son of Man vision, thrones in the plural um, and which, in, which I think connects with this, with the son of the, uh, and of course, it's no coincidence. I think that Jesus actually combines those texts in the gospel, um, especially when he's talking to Caiaphas. He says, "You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, as, uh, seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven." Combining Psalm 110 with Daniel 7:13, 14. 
Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that uh, Carlos failed to make his point on the Messiah um, and his deity. There's numerous other texts that teach the deity of the Messiah. Uh, among them uh, would be Isaiah 9, 6, where the Messiah is identified as the mighty God, El Gabor, using not the title Elohim, which is sometimes used of individuals who are lesser than God, like Moses in Exodus 7, 1, but El, El Gabor specifically, which is a title used of Yahweh. Um, Exodus, uh, the very next chapter, Isaiah 10, 21, uses that title of Yahweh um, himself, the El Gabor, the mighty God. Um, and there's numerous other texts that would that would suffice to show that point. I also argued that the angel of the Lord is a divine person. I gave numerous argumentation for this. I could literally go on for much longer and multiply me examples much further uh, to establish this point. Um, I pointed out Genesis 48, where you have the parallelism and the um, God of Israel equated with the angel of the Lord. Um, the angel of the Lord is also, of course, distinguished from Yahweh as well. Um, so you've you've got this uh, personal plurality and, and, and personal distinctiveness. Um, you've got uh, the, um, I, I also pointed out texts like in Judges 13 and other texts like Genesis 32 where people um, see, say we're doomed to die, we've seen God's face, we've seen the face of God. Um, and of course Exodus 30 through 20 says no one may see my face and live. And so that indicates that they interpreted uh, the angel of the Lord as a divine person. And there's numerous evidences uh, is used the angel of the Lord is used interchangeably with titles like Yahweh and God. Um, so there's just a, an avalanche of cumulative evidence showing us that the angel of the Lord is in fact a divine person. Um, lastly, I argued that the Messiah is the angel of the Lord. And I think also Carlos really struggled uh, in the cross-examination when we got to Malachi 3. And I pointed out that he was quite mistaken that the title messenger is never used of Yahweh because here it is right there. And he argued that this is indeed referring to the Messiah. So he conceded this point, but I don't think he uh, responded to my connection between this passage in Judges 2 verse 1, where uh, the messenger of the covenant in Judges 2 turns out to be the angel of the Lord. And here it turns out to be the Messiah. And also, of course, Malachi 3 ten, uh, seems to turn on its head, Exodus 23.20. Just as in Exodus 23.20, which uses very parallel language to this, Yahweh, um, uh, the angel of Yahweh prepares the way for the people of Israel. So here, the, uh, the, an Israelite who turns out to be John the Baptist prepares the way for, uh, for the angel of Yahweh to come. Um, and so I would uh, conclude by, again, uh, affirming my thesis in this debate that indeed the Old Testament affirms divine plurality and, uh, tr and Trinitarian theology, and that God has revealed himself as three, not just in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, highlighting the marvelous, wonderful, and beautiful continuity between the Old and New Testaments. And so I would encourage uh, Unitarians in the audience to um, to forsake their um, diminished view of, of God and their div diminished view of Christ and to embrace the, the triune God of Scripture, for the triune God of Scripture lives. Thank you for your attention. All right, El Gibor, just quickly before I summarize, El Gibor is used for human kings in Ezekiel 32, 21. Ezekiel 32, verse 21. My opponent also writes that the title El in Isaiah 9, 6, so you have El Gibor, mighty, the, God, the, the singular of Elohim, El, and mighty. El is used also for human judges in Psalm 82. Uh, rulers of the nations in Ezekiel 31, 11. But my opponent writes that it's never used in any sense other than that of absolute deity. It's actually also used for the leaders of the land in 2 Kings 24. And of course, it's uh, El appears in many names like Israel, Elijah, uh, Joel, uh, and even Daniel. So uh, just to clear that up. Also, I want to go back to Deuteronomy 29, just to make this point clear to the audience. In Deuteronomy 29, if the litmus test is that you are also Yahweh, because you're speaking in the first person as Yahweh, well, then Moses has to be part of this trinity. Uh, he clearly says, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. That's Moses speaking. Moses clearly says, verse 6, I am the Lord your God. Verse 10, before the Lord your God, they're standing before Moses, and Moses is the speaker. There's no one else. There's no angel. There's no uh, theophany. It's Moses himself. So are we to, to conclude that Moses is Yahweh as well? Not with you alone 
Am I making this covenant, says Moses? This is seen uh, by many Trinitarian scholars. The speaker's personality in Deuteronomy 29 is merged in that of the deity. That's in reference to Moses. Pulpit commentary. Moses introduces Jehovah himself as speaking to the people. And then you have Joshua 22. You obeyed all the, the, all the instructions of Moses, he says. Joshua 22, 2. And then the land that Moses gave you, and then carefully followed the commandments and teaches Moses gave you. But wait a minute, I thought it was Yahweh, the one God of Israel, who did that. So are we to conclude that Moses is part of this uh, uh, clued at uh, Trinity? Others as Yahweh in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 20, the word of Yahweh came to Ezekiel. And then he says, I swore to bring them out of Egypt. That's Ezekiel speaking. That's not an angel or anyone else. I gave them the Torah in verse 11. Joshua in, in uh, chapter 24, Joshua assembled all the tribes and they presented themselves before God. It's Joshua speaking. In 1 Samuel 10, Samuel assembled Israel. And then in verse 22, Israel asked Yahweh. They're asking they're asking a, a man, not, not Yahweh himself. So if this is the litmus test, that whenever a prophet speaks in the first person, and I could show you many more, that that means you're somehow part of a uh, plurality of, of, of a God. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. So to sum up, the scriptures clearly teach that the God of the Old Testament, in fact, the God of the entire Bible is one single individual, one self, one he, one person, that is the Father. And the Father obviously is working through agents. So why would we even bother talking about messengers, malak, angelos in Greek? Why would we be even bother if it's Yahweh or another person also called Yahweh that's talk, uh, speaking to us? Uh, so my opponent cannot possibly show that the Old Testament actually teaches, teaches, not just hints at, not just clues, not just foreshadows, but actually shows and explains this doctrine he so boldly yet inconsistently professes. And the inconsistency comes in what I just showed you, that Moses and, and the kings and prophets speak as God in the first person. To put it in simple terms, folks, hints and clues do not a teaching make. And we all know that God, as the creator of language itself, is the most competent teacher there is. So if God, if he teaches anything, it must, by definition, be clearly shown and explained. That's what teaching means. But as we just heard from my opponent himself, there is no Trinitarian to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. That should be the end of this debate, if it even is a debate. So first, to summarize my, po uh, summarize my points, I showed the many Trinitarian scholars, and uh, Jonathan says, well, I simply disagree with them. Well, you're talking about Leonard Hodgson, the noted Anglican priest, philosopher, theologian, historian of the early church, Regis Professor of Divinity at, at Oxford. That doesn't make him right, but you have to respect those kinds of titles. And he said, Christianity arose within Judaism and the monotheism of Judaism was then, as it is still today, Unitarian. Murray Harris, Dr. Murray Harris, Jesus as God. These are evangelicals. These are Trinitarians. Listen to this. It was not the triune God of Christian theology who spoke to the forefathers in the prophets. Second, I showed that the Shema clearly shows one person. There's no three persons, no other person, but the one Lord. One simply means one. It does not mean more than one. So I've shown that the biblical language cannot support the Trinitarian language that had to be created hundreds of years later as my opponent had to concede. This is a later creation and this is shown and taught by Jesus in the first and most important of the commandments, the Shema. So God is never a they, never a them, there, we, us, our. Uh, God never presents himself that way. 
Tens of thousands of singular personal pronouns cannot be ignored nor dissolved by uh, some exceptions of, or some misreadings by my opponent. If the evidence were reversed, that is, if God was referring to himself, himself, as they, them, their, etc., thousands upon thousands of times, we would obviously all come to a very different conclusion today. Third, the Bible is a story about two lords. Psalm 110, 1 is so important. Yahweh, uh, also called Adonai, says to my Lord, Adoni, never a title for deity, only humans and angels, as my opponent himself had to concede. Uh, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Again, it's the Son of Man is not deity. Humans are never worshipped as the one God of Israel, Yahweh. That's just impossible. So according to the Bible, according to Psalm 110, if this were not evidence enough, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, the Lord will be the only one and the Lord's name the only one. If these uh, scriptures are not ev evidence enough that, that shows that God is one person, I don't know what is. The biblical God is not an abstract idea, never an essence, never one what. And we look forward to that day as Zechariah foresaw here in Zechariah 14, when we look forward eagerly with outstretched necks, as, as one scripture says, to the day when this truth will finally be understood for what it is as God, as one divine person, that is the Father, Yahweh. We will begin uh, 30 minutes of Q&A with our audience. Please state who your question is to and ask your question, and then we will wait for their two-minute responses. A single verse or two that says that God is one being, three persons. I'd like you to perhaps expand more on your answers, please, sir. As for whether the Old Testament teaches the Trinity, again, as I said several times already, it depends what you mean by teach the Trinity. Um, as I said, I, I don't believe that the Old Testament uses the same philosophical categories that we find in Nicene Trinitarian Christianity. Uh, I've never argued that. Um, but I do think, just as the New Testament does, that the Old Testament affirms a plurality of divine persons, even though it affirms monotheism and numerous texts, um, and it, that it ascribes divine titles, prerogatives, and attributes not to one person, but to three divine persons, and it does so very consistently. Um, so that that's uh, what I have to say on that point. Yep, uh, I agree, uh, Jonathan. It is a philosophical construct. Uh, uh, if you go back to the history, if you if you read any Bible dictionary, don't believe the, the teachers or the preachers, uh, you'll see that most uh, take it back to the so-called Cappadocian fathers of the fourth century, fifth century. Totally philosophical, you won't you won't find that in the Old Testament, as my opponent has conceded, there is no one verse really uh, teaching that three Yahwehs equals one Yahweh, if I understood Jonathan correctly, that's his position. And, uh, and you will never find it because that's just a contradiction in terms. It cancels out. It's like an equation, you know, like a zero times zero equals zero, <laughs> something like that. Uh, thank you very much. Well, my question will be for Carlos, uh, but I do want to thank Carlos and Jonathan for putting themselves out there in the public uh, to show their own points of view here. Now, the question that I do have for Carlos is, in Isaiah 9-6, uh, we see that Isaiah identifies this child being born as El Gabor, the mighty God. Now, in Isaiah chapter 10, the very next chapter, in verse 21, he identifies Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, as being El Gabor, Mighty God. So the question would be, why would Isaiah identify this child in the exact same manner as he identifies the Holy One of Israel in the very next chapter? Uh, share titles are not doesn't mean you share an identity. Uh, I said in my closing there, I ask you to please check Ezekiel 32, verse 21. Ezekiel 32, verse 21, El Gibor there is used for humans, uh, leaders of, of nations. It simply means El Gibor, a mighty one. And these are just titles uh, given to people. And uh, again, shared titles does not a shared uh, identity make, <laughs> to, to pun a phrase. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Chris that uh, in Isaiah 9, 6, he's identified as uh, the mighty God, the El Gibor, uh, which... Uh, 
you know, he, he, I mean, there's other titles in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, which also denote his deity, such as, you know, Father of Eternity or Everlasting Father, depending how you want to translate it, um, Wonderful Counselor, um, etc. Um, he's, uh, as Chris rightly pointed out, in the very next chapter, uh, the, the, that very same expression is used of of Yahweh. And um, I, ne I need to check an interlinear on Ezekiel 32, 21. In my English translation, uh, which is the English Standard Version, it translates it the Mighty Chiefs. I'm not sure exactly what the Hebrew is there, so I need to check that, that point. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so I got a question. So here we see in Ezekiel chapter 37, very simple language we see here. This is how uh, somebody would just very uh, simply read the language here. Yahweh says, then they shall be my people and I will be their God. And then in the next chapter, 20, uh, next verse 24, he says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. Mm. So my question there, is Yahweh then his own servant? Is is David Yahweh? That's, that's a good question. Um, so um, I... Uh, so obviously the, um, Ezekiel was written uh, during the exile in Babylon, and this is hundreds of years after David had died. Um, I think here it, 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 that this is actually a reference to the Messiah. It's called my servant. He says, my servant David shall be king over them. He's the good shepherd. And of course, Jesus identifies himself as a good shepherd in, in, in John 10 uh, as well. They shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. Um, I Throughout the scriptures, uh, we see that uh, the Messiah is the son of David. He's the heir of David. He's the one to whom the Davidic promises apply. He gets to sit on David's throne forever. Uh, Isaiah 9 that we just talked about uh, just a short while ago uh, also speaks to that effect, saying that you know, he, he sits on David's throne, uh, upholding it, establishing it with justice and righteousness from that time forth and forevermore. Um, we see in uh, Isaiah 11 that he is the root of Jesse. Um, and there's there's numerous texts that would bear that out, but I just simply see that as a reference to the Messiah, who's there called David, because the Messiah is the greater David. You'll notice also, by the way, that in Isaiah 49, uh, the Messiah is actually called Israel, not because he is national Israel, but because he is the greater Israel, and he actually redeems and regathers, restores national Israel. So it says, you're my servant Israel, in whom I'll be glorified. And then it says that, he, that uh, verse 5, now the Lord got, the Lord says, he who formed me from the wind to be a servant to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. So individual Israel regathers and redeems, restores national Israel. So the Messiah is called Israel because he's the greater Israel. Likewise, in Ezekiel 34, he's called David because he's the greater David. And that person is Yahweh? The Messiah is Yahweh, yeah. Okay, so the David, the, the greater David is Yahweh, is that what you're saying? Correct. Interesting. The Messiah is Yahweh, is a, is a, is a divine person. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't believe David is Yahweh. Obviously, I don't believe the Messiah is Yahweh. Again, Messiah, it's like we're going uh, over what the Messiah means. Messiah means an anointed one of someone, and that someone we know is uh, Yahweh, is God. So uh, only a human being can be anointed. Uh, you cannot have an, uh, uh, an anointed Yahweh. That's just a contradiction in terms and all kinds of things. That text about the greater David, I do agree that it's a messianic text. And in a way, it, it, it is applying to a future figure that is David. So my question is to uh, Carlos here. Um, my question is pertaining to Psalms 110. Uh, a while back when yes. uh, Sir Buzzard was uh, on the webinar, uh, Jonathan McClatchy's webinar, by the way, um, we were talking about, he was talking with uh, uh, Anthony Rogers, um, and the question was on Psalm 110.5. So it says that the Lord, Adonai in this case, is at your right hand, and then it goes on to apply things like, he will shatter the chief man over a broad country, uh, he will drink from the brook by the wayside, he will lift up his head, and so on. And Sir Buzzard said that uh, this is... Um, obviously messianic language so that therefore verse 5 should apply to the messiah but interestingly the lord in the verse 5 is adonai it's it's a divine title so how would you interpret that right thank you so yes uh, adonai so the positions change in a way in verse 1 you have adonai sitting at the right hand and then verse 5 it says adonai is at the right hand of that we presume adonai 
in the previous psalm, uh, in a couple of places, including Psalm uh, 109, verse 30, I believe from memory, you have Yahweh or Adonai at the right hand of someone supporting them, giving them authority and so on. So I believe that this is uh, simply saying what other verses say, like Psalm 109, verse 30, where Yahweh can be at your right hand, but obviously not in a position uh, lower, if you will, than, than a human being. The, the, the issue I see here is uh, you, you believe that, of course, um, in the verse 5, this is talking about Yahweh, if, if I'm correct, right? It says uh, Adonai is at the right hand of the Adonai, yes. Right, right. So that's Yahweh. But the following verses apply messianic language. Like, for example, yep. uh, he will judge among the nations, fill them up with corpses, drink from the brook, lift up his yep. head, and so forth. And this is what yep. Sir Anthony Buzzard also agreed to. So it would seem that this he, who is in all of these verses, is the Lord from verse 5. It's, right. He's the plain referent. So right, if I this is the Messiah, and the Lord in verse 5 is Adonai, then wouldn't it follow that the Messiah is Adonai? No, because I believe it, again, it's the position of Yahweh at your right hand, God at your right hand, upholding you, and in this case, giving you authority to, I believe, it goes on to pick up the notion of this Adonai, sorry, the picture of this Adonai, striking down kings in the day of his anger. He executes judgments against the nations, uh, and so on. That's obviously uh, all applicable to the Messiah. The Messiah is given all authority, uh, as Jesus in, himself says in Matthew 28. Uh, I don't want to go to the New Testament much, but uh, again, this is uh, simply a way of showing you that the one Yahweh, the one Adonai, is at the right hand of his chosen one, his king, as it is shown in other verses, where Yahweh or Adonai can be at your right hand to give you support. And in this case, uh, the way I'm reading it, is given this Adonai figure, which is never God, never deity. It's always a human being. He has the ability now to strike down the kings and so on. And this is language, very messianic, beautiful language, right? That this human figure, this exalted figure, will execute judgment because he has the authority, the, the uh, power, if you will, and the backing of Yahweh Adonai, who's at his right hand. So uh, on, on the point about the uh, title Adonai never oh. applying to God, I completely disagree. Um, I gave the example during the rebuttals of Joshua 5, where the, where the phrase Adonai, my Lord, is used of the angel of the Lord, who in context turns out to be Yahweh because of the links to Exodus 3, uh, for example, uh, where um, where Yahweh appears in the burning bush. Uh, just as Moses is instructed to remove his sandals, so likewise uh, Joshua in Joshua 5 is instructed to remove his sandals for the place he's standing his holy ground. Now, uh, Vladimir is absolutely correct that uh, there's Messianic language used in, in those verses in Psalm 110. It links, I think, quite uh, clearly to Psalm 2, which is clearly a Messianic psalm. Hopefully we can agree on that. But in Psalm 2, it says, um, you know, uh, um, asking me uh, verse, from verse 8, asking me and I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, it corresponds to the mighty scepter in Psalm 110, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, very similar to the language used here in Psalm 110 about shattering kings on the day of his wrath, um, uh, etc. Um, and so we we have this, this connection between Psalm 110 and, and Psalm 2. Um, also, uh, as Vladimir pointed out, the, the pronouns, the he's in that text in verse uh, 5 through 7 are all referring back to the uh, the, ad, the Adonai from verse 5. And in, in verse 7, he drinks from a brook, by the way, that is a uniquely human function. So it suge suggests that the Adonai in verse 5 is in fact human. It's, it's not simply that, as Carlos argues, that it's the reversal of verse 1, uh, that just as uh, um, David's Lord sits at the right hand of Yahweh, so now also Yahweh sits at the right hand of David's Lord. Uh, I, I don't think that's a valid interpretation of this text. Uh, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Um, Carlos, my question is for you, and it's about Zechariah chapter 2, which is, you'll recall, came up during cross-examination. Uh, specifically, I want to read verses 10 and 11. It says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst. This sounds like it's Yahweh speaking. I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to, to you. 
Now, Carlos, I know that during cross-examination, you answered Jonathan's question by saying you think that uh, Yahweh is speaking of himself in a third person here, and I don't think that's altogether implausible, but what you do have here, if, if I understood you correctly, and I may not have, so please do clarify, what, what you have here is Yahweh saying that himself sent himself. He says, Yahweh, the Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. So is it your position that this isn't Yahweh, or is it your position that this is Yahweh send it, saying that he sent himself? Thanks, Chris, and thanks from, uh, for getting me back to this. Uh, I correct myself. I don't believe this is uh, God in the third person. I thought we were looking at some other passage here. So yes, I agree. It's not in the third person. I believe this is the prophet speaking for Yahweh, for God. And uh, he simply... Yes, it's simply rep repeating uh, the judgment that's going to come down uh, on the people here, I believe. And then uh, I will settle you in your midst, says verse 10, says the Lord, Yahweh, many nations will join themselves, etc. Again, uh, if we have two Yahwehs here, that's one Yahweh too many, according to the Shema. Okay, but just, I'm sorry, just to make sure I understood. Um, you just you just said that Yahweh says in verse ten, "I will dwell in your midst." But that but early, but moments before that, I think you said that verse eleven's "I will dwell in your midst" is actually the prophet speaking. Am I misunderstanding you? I think in context, I think it's the prophet speaking. Can we agree okay. the prophet is speaking here? Well, of course, the prophet is delivering the words of Yahweh. The question right. is, who who is it? That, let me put the question this way: Who is it that is going to dwell in the midst of Zechariah's uh, hearers? Yahweh. Is it Zechariah? Okay, so yep. Yahweh says in verse 11, I will dwell in your midst, mm -hmm. and you shall know that the Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. The singular person of pronouns there tell me that it goes back to someone, one person, not multiple persons. So I have to read in here then that one of the persons of this uh, plural God or plural Yahweh, as my opponent believes, is speaking, and then I have to uh, read into it which of the persons is speaking here? I think that's problematic for me to do. Okay, so if, if I understood you correctly, just for the sake of the listeners, and I'll let, and then I'll stop talking. You're saying you read into verse 11 based on your what your conclusions from other texts in Scripture that Yahweh says, "I will dwell in your midst," mm. and then Zechariah says, "You shall know that Yahweh has sent me to you." I think something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks Thank for the you. question. So uh, I think Chris is absolutely right, but uh, I'm thankful that Carlos has uh, strengthened his argument a bit because this is the alternative interpretation that's put forward by um, uh, uh, biblical critical commentaries. Um, they sometimes say this is a very difficult, perplexing passage to understand, and this is the best they can come up with or something to that effect. There are also, of course, commentaries that would take my view as well. Um, I find my view the more plausible of the two uh, opinions on this text. However, let me just argue for my view. Um, I think it's the most natural reading of the text plainly i think it's the most plain and obvious reading of the text first of all and secondly uh, if you read into zechariah chapter four and you get to uh verse um eight and nine it says then the word of the lord came to me saying and by the way zechariah at this point has been talking to the angel of the lord and the angel of the lord and the word of the lord are used kind of interchangeably uh, i think that provides the backdrop to john's theology of jesus as the divine logos but that's another story but in verse eight it says the word of the lord came to me saying the hands of zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house his hand shall also complete it then you will know that the lord of hosts has sent me to you so so here uh, the word of the Lord is actually the angel of the Lord, if you read the context carefully. The word of the Lord has been sent by Yahweh, and this is exactly the same construction, but he's talking to Zechariah. So it's not simply Zechariah interjecting here and saying, Daniel, the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. No, the word of the Lord is speaking directly to Zechariah and saying, then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So I think that my interpretation of this text is the most natural and plain reading of the text, and it is the correct interpretation if we read it contextually in view of chapter four. Yeah, hi, Carlos and Jonathan. My question is for Jonathan. Uh, so I think some some point in the debate, you mentioned that look at the second person of the Trinity, just as in John 1.18, that Jesus is expressing or exegeting the Father. So the same way the angel of the Lord or the Messiah as you said, they're the same in the Old Testament. That's the purpose of that person. But then if that's the case, then clearly the second person and the Trinity before and after incarnation are not the same. Because after incarnation, as the Trinitarians assert, uh, Jesus had two natures. So that person had two natures, but the person before incarnation only had one nature. Is that correct? 
which person in the Trinity do you hold? It cannot be both of them. It has to be one or the other. If I'm understanding your question correctly, here's my response. I think uh, that uh, that Christ only took to himself a second nature. His, his divine nature is eternal. He only took to himself a human nature at the point of the incarnation. Uh, when you see Christophanies or Theophanies throughout the Old Testament, I think God is appearing in human form. I don't think he's taken to himself an actual human nature. Um, that, that he, I, I think, think he's just simply appearing in human form uh, at that point. That is the person, the second person of the Trinity, the same before and after incarnation? Because yes. the second person after the, well, uh, is, doesn't that, uh, you know, after the incarnation, doesn't the person, the second person have two natures? Yes. But before that, he only has one nature? Yes. He takes to himself a second nature. This is the same person. Um, so this is where the Son of Man issue comes in, because most Trinitarian scholars, and I know uh, Jonathan can disagree and does disagree with the majority of his own scholars, but this is why uh, it baffles me that the Son of Man is even an issue here today, because uh, I, I believe, I may be wrong, that the majority do not interpret the title Son of Man uh, as deity there, uh, especially Son of Man, which simply means a human being, and this goes to the question, uh, simply means a, a flesh and, and, and blood human being as we know. Uh, the title is used uh, again and again for the prophet Ezekiel, for example, and obviously Jesus assumes that title's favorite self-designation, uh, I think around 60 times in the in the Gospels. So to say that in the Old Testament, we have a Yahweh that is a human being, basically that would be it. You have the second person of this Trinity is also a human being at that stage. And then I think the question was, well, how is that possible if at the incarnation, the doctrine of the Trinity, traditional historical understanding uh, of the ones who, who are teaching it or, or showing it, it's not really... A teaching uh, have got the son, the second person taking on flesh. So you have a Yahweh son of man, Yahweh human being in the Old Testament, and then this second person Yahweh takes on flesh again at the incarnation, at the virgin birth. If I'm following this correctly, uh, I think obviously there are dilemmas there, as, uh, as the questioner uh, observed. Moses foretold another prophet like him. If Jesus were God, would his witnessing for him be truly valid? I completely affirm the text of Deuteronomy 18. Uh, there's a prophet uh, like Moses uh, who comes after Moses. And of course, at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, it um, it closes by saying that uh, no prophet like Moses ever arose in Israel um, in, De in Deuteronomy chapter 34. tend to think that the text in Deuteronomy 34 is actually a post-exilic redaction into Deuteronomy. A uh, number of reasons for that, one of them being that it says that no one knows where Moses was buried to this day, suggesting a long time after um, after Moses' life that this is being written about, um, etc. And so I, I actually take this as uh, post Malachi. This is actually after the close of the prophetic era. I think I think uh, that indicates that it's a, it's a messianic text um, in Deuteronomy 18. Trinitarian Christians think that Jesus is a prophet. We think that we're, we're not Unitarians, we're Trinitarians. We think that the Son is a prophet and he is sent by the Father. So in that sense, he's a prophet, he's a messenger. So I, I'm not really quite sure what the question is getting at, but that's the best I can do. I'll just repeat uh, some of what I said. Uh, I think the question is, well, how, how is this even a, a true prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 if, if Yahweh, the one God, uh, will raise up someone? Now, this language of being raised up, uh, scholars, again, many Trinitarian scholars, check your dictionaries and so on, uh, is synonymous. Raising up is synonymous with begetting, with bringing into existence. And we know that the Messiah was to be the seed of the woman, as I said, a human being in, from Genesis 3. God will raise up this figure like that. And you also have the prophecy in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. I will raise up for them a righteous branch, a descendant of David. That cannot be older than David. Your descendant, your son, cannot be older than yourself. They can have more authority. Uh, the, the son can be, uh, can be bestowed with more authority than the father if God so, so chooses, and he does. 
This is where Psalm 110 1 comes in. So this Messiah figure, this prophet that is raised up, he, he, as I stated, uh, Isaiah 49 verse 5 in the Greek translation, the Lord formed me from the womb. These are prophecies of someone not in existence, a descendant from the family line of David, Psalm 102. It, uh, he's called a shoot, Isaiah 11. Uh, I don't see how this figure that is being prophesied is already in existence. And apart from that, is a second Yahweh in the one Yahweh that uh, Jonathan believes in. So that's three Yahwehs in one Yahweh, again, which is uh, totally unorthodox, I believe. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt from Exodus 32, 4. These pass, this, I guess, this passage indicates in a slower reading an interesting detail was brought to my attention during a Bible study. This passage seems to point a one, but more than one. Aaron forms one calf, but then said it represented a uh, multiple gods. These are your gods. I lean towards another Old Testament passage for a possibility for a Trinitarian God or a Trinitarian possibility because it wasn't strange of seeing one but representing plurality as Trinitarian claim one but more than one. Uh, okay, so there's it's one calf that represents multiple gods. I I guess I yes, there okay. was one calf and it represented. It said these are your gods. Right, it's one calf still. It's not two calves. It's not three. It's not four. So one retains its its meaning. Again, we, I go back. Uh, I think it's just a a sort of uh, misnomer, if that's the word. Just because you have one uh, bunch of grapes. It means that you change the meaning of the word one. No, it, it, you only have one bunch of grapes. One flesh, again, doesn't mean two fleshes. One calf, uh, one cow, one horse, one herd doesn't change the meaning of the word one. So whatever other words you want to use uh, with the word one, you still have just one herd, not two herds, one cluster of grapes, uh, not two clusters of grapes. The one calf, obviously, as you were reading there, the one calf will represent many gods, but it's still one calf. It's not two, it's not three. That's why I asked, how many then is, is this compound one, complex one? How many? And why does it just go up to three? Why can it be four? I mean, uh, my opponent uh, observed that Israel, uh, one Israel, and then it's talked about with singular personal pronouns, but uh, multiple people, obviously a nation. So is the implication that Yahweh, the one God of Israel, is like a corporation? So is Yahweh a corporation? I don't think that's uh, viable. I don't think that's what the Hebrew scriptures teach. And obviously the word one, to go back to the question, one calf is not two calves. It's as simple as that. The Hebrew word yom can refer to a composite unity or compound unity. And I gave the example of Genesis 2.24, Adam and Eve become one flesh. Uh, I gave the example of uh, Genesis 3.22, Adam and Eve become one with God using Akkad in both cases. Genesis 1.5, the Yom Akkad, the first day is a combination of two things, the evening and the morning. Uh, in Genesis 11.6, uh, the people were one, again, using the Hebrew word Akkad. Uh, in Genesis 34, um, verse 16, verse 22, the Shechemites wanted to become one people with the Jews. In Second Chronicles 30, verse 12, God gave the people one heart, Lev Echad. Uh, in Ezra 2:64, the congregation of 42,360 persons was described as one, again using the Hebrew word Echad. In Jeremiah 32, 39, under the New Covenant, God will give his people one one heart again lev ikad so in all these cases yes it's one it's one flesh etc or uh, or um um one or one people but it's but that 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 oneness has a as a compound uh, or composite element to it so it's a it's it's got, so as a trinitarian christian i believe that god is one i completely affirm the, sh the shema of israel deuteronomy 6 4 
but I think that God is com complex in his unity. And, and so I, I think that the Shema and this use of the Hebrew word ikad for one is very, very consistent with that. God is spoken of as sitting on his throne and invited someone prophetically other than himself, sit at my right hand in Psalm 110. But where is the Holy Spirit sitting on or even being invited to sit on another throne with the Father and his Son? The Father and the Son are, quote, pictured together. Why is the Holy Spirit so neglected if, quote, it or he is an equal part of the Trinity? Well, the text in Psalm 110, I think, does not deal with the Holy Spirit. But as I pointed out in my opening statement, there are many other texts that do. Um, I gave uh, the uh, examples um, where the Holy Spirit, I, I gave Isaiah 63, for example, verse 10, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, which connects with Psalm 78, 40. I gave um, various other examples where the Holy Spirit is involved in creation, like Psalm 104, verse 30, etc. Um, the Holy Spirit is uh, also involved in imparting wisdom in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. He's said to inspire the scriptures um, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, uh, Zechariah 7, verse 12, Nehemiah 9, verse 30. Uh, he's described as being personally distinct in Isaiah 48, 16, and Psalm 104, verse 30. Uh, he's also specifically called the Spirit of God in Genesis 1, 3, in Exodus 31, ver verse, verse 1 to 3, in Numbers 24, verse 2, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 10, in Psalm 106, verse 32, 33. Um, he has various characteristics of deity applied to him, including the ability to create in Job 33, 4, or Psalm 104, 30, omniscience in Isaiah 40, verse 13. He has tremendous power, uh, Judges 14, verse 6, Isaiah 11, verse 2, Zechariah 4, verse 6, and he owns omnipresence, Psalm 139, verse 7. So it's hard not to see how the Holy Spirit is deity from the entire testimony of the Holy uh, of the Holy Scriptures. I, I, do, I don't I uh, compartmentalize the scriptures and, and just derive my theology from one part of scripture, but I but I'm not just I don't just affirm sola scriptura, but I also infer, affirm tota scriptura, that all of scripture is um, useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How can I, we call it the doctrine of the third person of the Trinity it took hundreds of years more? by the way, uh, check your histories, check the councils. There were hundreds of councils, by the way, debating these issues going back and forth about the Holy, uh, no, sorry, about the uh, Christology and then about the spirit. Many scholars have obviously considered the fact that there is no third person in the Old Testament. Uh, obviously there's no second person. So uh, the spirit is never worshiped. The spirit doesn't have a throne. I think that was the question. Uh, what happened to the throne of the spirit? Uh, the spirit of God is God, is Yahweh. Uh, I showed an example of, of the son where his uh, spirit was grieved. If your spirit, I mean, even today, it's a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew idiom. It's also an idiom to this day where my spirit uh, will be with you. You know, I am with you in spirit. It doesn't mean my spirit is a separate, distinct person apart from myself. Uh, the, this is taught uh, in the New Testament, by the way, in <laughs> First Corinthians. But to stay within the Old Testament, um, these are qualities of God as well that are personified. A personification uh, doesn't mean a separate, distinct person. So uh, the attributes of God include uh, his word, obviously, his arm with his arm, his reward with wisdom, with might, the famous Proverbs 8 where the Sophia, the wisdom of, of God, is personified as a she, as a woman. And many, I know, Trinitarians believe that was uh, the son of God, I guess, a, a, as a daughter of God back then. But obviously, <clears throat> it just piles up the problems that you have when you create a, se a separate third distinct person apart from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is is God in his action, is, is, is God himself expressing himself. Uh, the spirit is always personal, always personal. We do not hold the Jehovah's Witness uh, line that it's impersonal, like electricity. Uh, it's always personal. It always pertains to someone, uh, to a human being, or, or obviously in this case to Yahweh, the one God of Israel. God's attributes solely belong to God alone. In saying that in Genesis, the angel of the Lord is asked to forgive sins. Then it says in Genesis 19.24, Yahweh sent fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. My question is, how can Yahweh send something from Yahweh if there is not two divine persons being spoken of? The angel forgives sins. Right? The priest in the temple forgives sins. 
that that was their function uh so i don't quite see again this is a an issue of the messenger being authorized to do certain things that that god does only supposedly uh, god raises the dead multiple prophets raise the dead and so on so that's uh that's an attribute given to someone by the one god yahweh now this notion of yahweh to yahweh is basically uh, we have uh, examples. This is a Hebrew idiom where you have the same subject repeated twice. I'll give a, a, a few examples. Genesis 17, verse 23. Abraham took every male among the men from Abraham's house. Genesis 17, 23. Is that to Abraham's? Uh, 1 Kings 8, 1. Solomon assembled unto Solomon. So the... The one Solomon assembled people unto Solomon. That's two Solomons. Uh, I can give you more. First Kings 12, uh, Re Rehoboam uh, was come to Jerusalem. He assembled the house of Judah to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. So this, is, uh, this appears throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, where the subject is repeated. Uh, but it obviously doesn't mean that you're talking about two separate distinct Abrahams, two separate distinct Solomons in First, first Kings 8, uh, and so on. So that's how I would answer the age-old Genesis 19.24. Genesis 19.24, I think, does distinguish between divine persons. The issue with, with sorry, Genesis, Genesis 19.24 is that um, we already have Yahweh on earth, who appears uh, as the angel of Yahweh, and then uh, he reigns on Sodom and Gomorrah, self and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. So you have Yahweh who's represented on earth, who is on earth, and you have Yahweh in heaven, and the Yahweh who's on earth reigns self and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Now, um, this this seems to be the way that uh, the um, the original audiences read it. Um, I gave um, earlier uh, a quote from the Aramaic Targum, a targum of Zidra Jonathan concerning this text, where it speaks about the word of the Lord raining on Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, fire and brimstone from before the Lord of the heavens. I think that also clearly distinguishes between divine persons. Uh, also, if you look at, um, as I pointed out earlier, um, other times where that text is referenced or alluded to elsewhere in scripture, it switches between first and third person pronouns. Uh, Isaiah 13 is a good example of this. Isaiah 13, verse 17 through 19 says, um, Behold, I, uh, first person, am stirring up the meats against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them, switching to the third person there. This, the same thing happens in Amos 4.11 and in Jeremiah 50 as well. Doctrines that rely on words like it seems, it implies, it appears, etc. is very suspect. The essential teaching of the Trinity is missing in the Old Testament as clearly stated by many trained Trinitarian scholars. But there is a clear teaching that Yahweh is one person, self, thousands of times. How can an inferred teaching be an essential doctrine for a Christian? I, I think it's inescapable that God reveals himself in multiple persons in the Old Testament. Um, I think that uh, the evidence I adduced in my opening statement and, and throughout this debate have been sufficient to show that. I, I think that the, um, the, the deity of Christ, the deity of the Father, the deity of the Holy Spirit are clear in both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, so I don't think this is an ambiguous issue. Um, the, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. The first usage of the word Trinity in, in, the, in the, uh, sense of the, um, of the, uh, the sense that we understand it is Tertullian of Carthage in the late second century. Um, the words does not precede that um, as far as we know anyway, but, but I think the concept is certainly there in the Old Testament. Certainly the, the, the but the key propositions associated with the Trinity, I think, are, are expressed in both the Old and New Testaments, even if the word, um, it doesn't appear there, or even if there's not an individual verse that, that indicates uh, to that effect. Uh, yes, it's not a teaching. Again, a teaching is show me and explain to me. Uh, my opponent has conceded that it doesn't. Uh, I think from the get-go, the, the question uh, is very difficult for one who, who um, follows this view. Um, it's amazing that we have to prove Trinity from uh, the use of uh, the, the third person. When I speak about myself in the third person, uh, that's proving a Trinity. 
uh, that the angel, my messenger, is is myself. Uh, that that's uh, that's quite odd uh, in the biblical Hebraic context. When you have the we haven't even we didn't touch the Jewish principle known as agency, especially in the ancient Near East, when the agency was mu much more of a, uh, a literal uh, way of looking at it, if you will. In other words, if I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking as God, as I showed in Deuteronomy 29 and the other texts where prophets, where Moses, where kings speak as in the first person as God. And to look at that in a literal way is to totally destroy the Hebrew scriptures and how they uh, uh, how they use the language of, of their of their own uh, traditions regarding uh, God, the one God of Israel. Uh, Trinitarian scholars, again, uh, my opponent is free and, and obviously he can disagree uh, with the majority of Trinitarian scholars. But these are these aren't, uh, you know, uh, a small, small Trinitarian. I don't, I don't even know. How, these are standard works of Trinitarianism. These are standard scholars of Trinitarianism. It is very difficult for them to show and explain that which means a teaching that the Old Testament, the, the one God, the Yahweh of the Shema, the, is more than one person. Uh, they have to concede it. My opponent, again, like I said in my closing, very boldly professes something that is uh, uh, very strange for me, uh, uh, strange for him, sorry, to try and, and, and maintain. It's an untenable position that uh, bigger names than all of us probably here ha have conceded. And, and I think that is an honest position, by the way. I commend them for conceding that notion that there's any type of uh, plurality of persons in the Shema. The, the Shema is one person, uh, the name of a person. That person is Yahweh, the one God of Israel. So...